so the logical question when I first introduced this data uh, to different people, whether they're speech pathologists or others, is why do we do it? Why do we, if we know that pegs are riddled with complications and don't actually provide um, benefit to our patients with dementia, why are we as care providers continuing to recommend them? Or even if we don't recommend them, why are we finding ourselves with patients on our caseload with advanced dementia and PEGS? Okay, so the answer to this question actually is multifactorial. There are lots of factors at play here. First, families and patients are often unaware of or have difficulty coping with the terminal prognosis that is quite honestly staring, at them, the, staring them in the face. But even when they are aware of that piece of information, there's a social dynamic between provider and the patient and the family that we are superior in knowledge and that they must trust us implicitly or that lots and lots of interventions equals high quality care. But I would argue that it's our role to educate them otherwise. They don't have, um, because we haven't given them the information, they don't have the information about risks associated with PEG placement or the lack of benefit that PEGs provide. There's also a natural comprehension that if one doesn't eat or drink, they will quote unquote starve to death, right? We've all had patients that have said, well, what am I supposed to do? Let them starve. And that feeling by patients and family, well, that feeling by families that they are complicit with the death of their family member is really difficult to struggle with. Um, this might be getting a little ahead of ourselves, but tube feeding is quite simply faster and requires less work on the part of other caregivers. That includes family and friends who would need to take the time to feed the patient, the time that they may perceive that they don't have. So time can contribute to our decision making to place a peg. And of course, there's cultural and religious components that we'll get into later in this course, as well as lack of advanced directives, which we had talked about previously, specifically related to wishes for nutrition and hydration. For example, a common one that can come up is thin liquids with increased aspiration risk versus nectar thick liquids and the dehydration risk associated or less pleasure of in with intake with nectar thick liquids. Because you might think that nectar thick liquids are safer, but if the patient doesn't like them, they don't drink them enough, then all of a sudden we have different complications and they're not actually in a safer situation. So we need to move ourselves, if there's anything about you that feels paternalistic, like you have the control or the right to decide this for your patient because of your education on this topic, you need to sit down and talk with your patient until they are as educated as you are about the pros and cons, because there's no one right answer here. And help them move from a place of non-compliance, which suggest, again, suggests like a bad behavior, to informed refusal. Or informed acceptance, which would be great for you and your patient to be on the same page. But if you're not on the same page, you need to be moving them into a place of informed refusal. That's your job. In addition, you really have to think about who your audience is for any written documentation you create. I've already mentioned this a little bit, but you need to tailor your written documentation, as well as your verbal communication, for that matter, um, to who your audience is. And that means you have to understand where your coworkers are coming from. Uh, what they're looking for. You have to ask, you know, why did you consult me on this patient? Is there something specific, a specific question you wanted me to answer? Um, and use your written note to show them how you can help them reach their goals. Jim Moe's settlement had a huge impact, a uh, positive effect on the provision of therapy services for patients with progressive deteriorating conditions, many of whom are at end of life, which is why it's relevant um, to our topic, although, you know, of course we know that not all people with progressive deteriorating conditions are at end of life yet, but they all will be at some point. Now that the settlement is in place, Medicare acknowledges that oftentimes skilled nursing and other services um, are required for patients at the end of life, um, even if they haven't elected hospice, uh, because the patient may be comfort measures only but they might still require some skilled level of service in a variety of ways, including symptom management uh, with medication or other therapies, and then also anticipating side effects and observing and, uh, and monitoring, assessing the patient's response to therapies or medications. And so the rule now is that it must be clearly documented in the medical record that the care that you're providing or the services that you are providing are so inherently complex 
that only the skills, knowledge, and judgment of a skilled professional can provide it. So you really have to talk yourself up here as speech pathologists. You have to prove that you need specific information and knowledge that you have acquired as a speech pathologist in order to provide these services. Um, And so you really have to think about what therapy activities are you doing and therefore documenting on um, and whether or not they're really beneficial to the patient's long-term plan, okay? We need to fix these problems. We need to make sure that our documentation is proving that we are addressing not just the easy therapy goals or targets or the ones that we always work on um, or goals written to match the worksheets that we carry around in our backpacks, um, but rather our documentation should prove that the therapy that we've selected to provide is medically necessary to improve this person's life. In other words, with regard specifically to end-of-life care, Um, Documentation should not indicate that you're working on specific impairment-based goals necessarily. Um, I know that might be shocking for some people to hear. Um, But for example, a goal like increasing the patient's ability to read longer passages or um, decreasing aspiration risk or preventing aspiration, those aren't necessarily appropriate goals for an end-of-life patient. Rather, Um, Your goal, you could be working on those tasks, but they're not necessarily appropriate goals, okay? Um, We would be working on language or communication and swallowing tasks that are contextualized and personally meaningful and supports the family's needs during their end of lifetime together. A quick literature search on speech language pathologist and palliative care clearly shows that the majority of our work in this population is presumed to be associated with dysphagia. However, we would be remiss to have a course on end of life that did not address the other half of our job as speech language pathologists, communication. We'll start by actually explaining who these patients are that need communication management, if you don't already have them in mind. We will review the communication needs that might come up most frequently at end of life, but the bulk of this section will be spent discussing treatment and evaluation methods that might actually come in handy during your supportive or palliative rehabilitation of communication deficits with these types of patients. I was working with a patient in his mid to late 60s who had had, over the course of a year, a series of of devastating strokes. Given the severity of his dysarthria, he had been rendered all but nonverbal. In addition, he had limited upper extremity mobility bilaterally due to swelling as well as weakness. So here we were working with him to establish a communication system with eye gaze and head nods. Our work was limited, repeatedly limited by his fatigue levels. Consistently, he was unable to work for more than 15 to 20 minutes at a time. He could barely eke out a word or two during that time using a letter board. Finally, I was able to get a laser pointer for him, positioned it in the perfect spot on the perfect day when he had a good amount of energy. And all of a sudden, our communication was more efficient than it had ever been before. You know what he spelled? I'm nauseous. I went out to tell the nurse, Mr. X says he's nauseous. Her jaw dropped to the floor. He had been at the hospital for weeks, unable to communicate even the most basic thoughts or ideas. No one knew he was feeling sick. And all of a sudden, due to our intervention, he had been able to access a medication he really needed to treat a symptom that no one knew he had. That was success in meeting our patient where he was. We worked tirelessly for days to figure out the perfect situation for him, and it worked out just in time. 